today we're starting Napoleon's Marshall series. <laughs> this is going to be a fun video to try and film. <laughs> It's raining outside right now, which is why she's not outside playing. But I have to film this video, so here we are. <laughs> So the Napoleon's Marshall series is a highly, highly, highly requested series for me to do. There's actually so many comments from people asking me to do this that I can't even like fit them on the screen here. So Roger's got his Napoleon hat on again. I've got on my like military theme shirt, you know, which I might wear when we do these sort of military videos. And I apologize for all of the ruckus going on behind me, but um, you know, Scarlet is one of those dogs that's very clingy. She's what we call a Velcro dog, and she just wants to be around me all the time, no matter where I am. I apologize if you find it annoying. Hopefully she'll calm down here in a few minutes, but you know, it's the middle of the morning and she's a little wound up right now. Now, obviously, as we watched all of the Napoleonic Wars videos, we were introduced, or at least I was introduced, to the Marshals. I can only remember, like, three of their names, though. Um, DeVoe, I think, was my favorite one out of all of them. Um, Bernadotte, who ended up betraying Napoleon and going to the other side. He was uh, Prince of Sweden, ended up being a Prince of Sweden. And Marshal Ney, I believe, is the other one. The other Marshals, for whatever reason, I can't recall their names, but I'm sure that I'll recognize them in this series. Now, I say DeVoe is my favorite one just because he seemed to be pretty much just as brilliant as Napoleon when it came to like battlefield tactics. He seemed to be like one of the more reliable marshals for Napoleon. So I kind of respect him from that standpoint, but I don't really know anything about like his personal life or whatever. Now there are a couple of these videos that... <laughs> okay, you know what? I'm gonna let her out. Oh the joy of doing these videos with a dog. We're not really sure what breed she is. We're waiting on DNA test results, but we think that she might have some Belgian Malinois in her or at least some German Shepherd. Whatever her mixed breed is, she is extremely energetic, which makes me think that she has some Belgian Malinois in her. And she's only two, so she's still a little puppyish as well. And uh, she doesn't do well indoors for very long before she gets really, really like antsy and restless and wants to go back outside and chase squirrels and stuff. Anyway, back to this. I don't even remember what I was talking about. Oh, I know what I was about to say. There are a couple of videos in this series that are around 40 minutes long, so what I might do is split those into two parts, just because when I start doing comment time with them, those videos will probably get into 50, 55, 60 minutes long. And I know a lot of you would probably watch an hour-long video, but a lot of you sometimes just don't have time for that, so I prefer to kind of keep videos on YouTube at least a little bit shorter. Plus, it just means there's more Napoleon to go around. And Roger gets to wear his hat for a few more videos. All right, well, I am eager to get into this and learn more about Napoleon's marshals. It'll be interesting to see if DeVoe ends up being my favorite marshal by the end of this. I might learn some stuff about some of the other marshals that is pretty appealing, so who knows? <laughs> Terror belly, decus pacis. Terror in war, ornament in peace. The words inscribed on every French marshal's baton. Huh. In France, the title of marshal or maréchal goes back at least to the 13th century. It represents the highest possible position of military authority. Authority symbolized by a marshal's baton. The title was abolished during the French Revolution as incompatible with the egalitarian spirit of the age. But in 1804, Napoleon founded a new empire and restored the ancient rank. That year, he picked 18 of France's best generals and made them marshals of the empire. I didn't Eight know there... more were created in the years that followed. Okay. The marshals that's actually way more than I thought that there were because in the Napoleonic Wars, um, I feel like only a handful of these were mentioned. So I thought that there was maybe like five, six, seven marshals. I had no idea there were this many of them. And out of these, I recognize Bernadotte, Berthier. I, I remember him being mentioned a lot. Maybe Bessier's 
Devoe, of course. Grouchy. <laughs> Jor Jordan. I uh, don't recognize him. Kellerman. Don't recognize Lands, of course. I re recognize that one. Lef... Lef... Uh, man, these French names. They're hard for me to pronounce. Lefer... Uh, I don't know how to say it long. Uh, Marmot, of course. I remember that one. McDonald, I remember him being mentioned once or twice. Messina... Monsi, Mortier, Marat, I remember him. Ney, of course. Aldenant, Perignon, maybe I remember him. Pontlau, uh, Pontlatowski. Saint Cyr, I feel like I remember him being mentioned. Uh, Salt, I remember him being mentioned. Suchet, of course, I remember him. And Victor. Okay, so I, I remember maybe a few more of these than I thought, but yeah, a lot, I mean, at least half of these, I don't, I don't remember. I mean, maybe they were mentioned in the, the, in the uh, Napoleonic Wars series, but there were a lot of videos in that, so it's hard for me to remember all of the details of everything. Eight more were created in the years that followed. The marshals outranked everyone in the new empire, apart from Napoleon's family, princes, and ministers of state. They came from every background, sons of aristocrats and innkeepers, professional soldiers, and those who'd learned on the job, old school Republicans and Bonaparte loyalists. The youngest, just half the age of the oldest. And though Marshal was a civil title, not strictly a military rank, the men known to the army as Les Gros Bonnets, the Big Hats, were arguably the most extraordinary, diverse, brilliant, and flawed group of military commanders in history. He just mentioned the hats. I have a really quick question. I saw mention that Napoleon's hat, he just like turned it sideways. It was meant to go long ways, right? So Napoleon turned it sideways and wore it that way. Um, was that just like a quirk of his? That he likes wearing his hats that way? What's the story behind that? The most favored were showered with titles and wealth. But the price too was high. Half were wounded, three were killed or died of wounds. Two were executed. This is Epic History TV's guy. You know what? He looks very, very casual right there for um, about to be executed. This is Epic History TV's guide to Napoleon's marshals. All 26 have been ranked according to our own evaluation of their achievements oh. as marshals, with expert guidance from retired Lieutenant Colonel Remy Port, former chief historian of the French Army. First, a thank you to our sponsor, Call of War. More than 2,000 French generals served in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. Many were brilliant leaders. A few probably deserved to be marshals, more than some who were. Any selection can only be difficult and highly subjective, but here's our pick of 12 of the best. Bertrand. Napoleon's faithful aide-de-camp, who commanded 4th Corps at the Battle of Leipzig. Clausel, a veteran commander of the war in Spain. Dessay, Napoleon's close friend, killed at Marengo, aged 31. Prince Eugène, Napoleon's adopted son, a hero of the Russian retreat. Gérard, one of Napoleon's best corps commanders by 1814 made a marshal by King Louis-Philippe in 1830. Goudon, whose infantry division bore the brunt of the fighting at Auerstedt in 1806, died of wounds near Smolensk in 1812. Junot, who first served with Napoleon at Toulon in 1793, probably committed suicide after his fall from favour in 1813. La Salle, the Hussar general, among the best light cavalry commanders of the Napoleonic Wars, killed at Wagram, aged 34. Maison, who told his division on the morning of Leipzig that they must win that day or all be killed, made marshal by King Charles X in 1829. Non the heavy cavalry commander who died of wounds and exhaustion, aged 46. Saint he just mentioned King Charles. For some reason, I associate King Charles with England, not France, but maybe France has some King Charles as well. Is that, uh, which King Charles is, is he talking about? Like what country? It has to be France, right? Saint-Hilaire, hero of Austerlitz, died of wounds received at Aspern in 1809. 
Van Damme, of whom Napoleon once said, if I had to invade hell, I'd want him commanding the vanguard. And now, Napoleon's 26 marshals, ranked in order of merit. So it's like Jean-Claude 26. Thing, yeah. Marshal Perignon. When Napoleon created the first 18 marshals, four were honorary marshals, recognised for past service to France. Perignon was one of these. A former officer in the Royal Army, he'd won fame in the Revolutionary Wars, fighting the Spanish on the Pyrenees front. He later served as ambassador to Spain. After a brief retirement, he was sent to Italy, and commanded the French left wing at the disastrous Battle of Novi, where the army was routed by Suvorov's Russians, and Perignon was badly wounded and captured. His appointment as Honorary Marshal in 1804 was a political move by Napoleon, a way to win acceptance for his new empire, by emphasising continuity with the revolution, by rewarding its military heroes. Wow. Perignon never Created Marshal of the Empire? Okay, so is that probably like the highest honor he could get other than being Emperor himself, maybe? Also, he's mentioning, you know, I, I know the Napoleonic Wars mentioned him in like Italy and uh, Egypt, but those videos really didn't go into Napoleon's campaigns into those areas. It mostly talks about, you know, I guess Northern Europe or whatever. I, I don't know how you guys distinguished parts of Europe. So those areas are ones that I'm not really super clued in onto when it comes to uh, Napoleon's invasions of certain areas and his control over Italy and stuff. I'm just assuming that he invaded Italy and Egypt, but that stuff may have gone down differently too. So you guys let me know exactly how and why Napoleon is in those certain areas if there are any videos, you know, that would cover that, um, that would be good to watch. By rewarding its military heroes. Perignon never held active command as a marshal, but served as governor of Parma, and later Naples. His eldest son, Pierre, was a cavalry officer, killed at Friedland in 1807. Perignon retired in 1813, but refused to support Napoleon when he returned from exile in 1815 and was stripped of his marshal's baton. His rank was later restored by King Louis XVIII. 25. Marshal Broom. Broom was another marshal whose appointment owed much to politics. As a fiery Republican and former close ally of revolutionary leader Georges Danton, his support was politically useful for Napoleon. Brun joined the army during the Terror, the most extreme period of the revolution. His political connections ensured rapid promotion, and he was sent to help put down a counter-revolutionary revolt in Bordeaux. In 1795, as a 30-year-old brigadier general, he helped Napoleon disperse a royalist mob in Paris, with the famous whiff of grapeshot. Brun then served with Napoleon in Italy, fighting in several of his famous early victories. He won a reputation as a fierce divisional commander and enthusiastic plunderer of Italian towns and churches. In 1798, he commanded the French occupation of Switzerland, while extorting 200,000 francs from the wealthy Swiss communes, the equivalent of several million dollars today. It was said that Brun's personal carriage was so laden with gold when it left Switzerland that it immediately broke down. The next year he won his most important victory, while commanding French forces in Holland, defeating an Anglo-Russian army at the Battle of Castricum, and saving France from invasion. But a short, calamitous spell commanding the army of Italy convinced Napoleon that Brun was not fit for high command. Instead, he sent him to be ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, where in 1804, he learned that he'd been made a marshal. But Brun's lack of delicacy, combined with a towering sense of self-importance, did not make him a successful diplomat. He was recalled to France, but as governor of the Hanseatic ports, blundered again. 
drafting a treaty with Sweden that failed to make any mention of the French Emperor. Whether a deliberate insult or act of incompetence, Napoleon was furious, and Brune was sacked. Brune? Well, this poor guy just can't do anything right, can he? Napoleon was furious, and Brune was sacked. Brune spent the next seven years at his country estate. He bitterly opposed the return of the Bourbon monarchy in 1814, and rallied to Napoleon when he returned from exile the next year. It's a nice looking estate. But in the tumult following Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo, Brune was cornered by a royalist mob in Avignon, murdered, and tossed into the River Rhone. You know, he just said royalist there. That just reminded me that I've heard Republican and royalists throughout, you know, these videos and uh, and this one too. And just throughout several of my videos, especially the Spanish Civil War one that I did recently. Um, you know, before I watched all of this stuff, I had a very American viewpoint on things. We don't use the terms royalist over here. And when we say Republican, we don't think of it in the same way that Europeans think of it because Republican is a political party over here. So, so you guys just think about politics differently over there than we do over here. And it's been very eye-opening to me to kind of understand because I was totally just oblivious to how the rest of the world might perceive politics differently than the United States. So I have to say that that's one good thing about these videos, is it's kind of expanded my horizons on uh, just like worldwide politics and government and how things work in other parts of the world. 24, Marshal Serrurier. Serrurier, I can't say these names. Uh, he retained all the characteristics and severity of an infantry major, an honest man with integrity and reliability. Unfortunate as a general. Okay. Wasn't a good general, but employee liked him as a guy, I guess. Serrurier was another of the four honorary marshals whom Napoleon wished to recognize for past service. In contrast to Brune, Serrurier was a professional soldier of the old school a veteran of the Seven Years' War, and a stern disciplinarian. This background was not necessarily an asset during the French Revolution, when any officer who'd served in the Royal Army was viewed with suspicion. But Colonel Serrurier's training and diligence were soon recognised as assets to the new French Republic. By 1795, he was a general serving with Napoleon in Italy, where his stand against corruption and looting won him the nickname the Virgin of Italy. Serrurier was a reliable, if unspectacular, commander, who won an important victory at Mondovi at a crucial moment in Napoleon's rise to fame. The following year, he accepted the Austrian surrender at the end of the long siege of Mantua. You know these, these Two, pictures? At the end. That's one thing I've really, really liked about this Epic History TV series is I love looking at these pictures for some reason. They're just very, ca you know, eye-catching to me. It would be really cool to have like a book or something. I don't know. Is there a book? You guys, you guys would probably know if there are books, like picture books of these, like collections of these paintings of the Napoleonic Wars, the era, all of that stuff. Where some of the paintings have not been that great to look at, you know, with body parts and, you know, some of the battlefields are pretty gruesome looking. But for the most part, I would say that I've really enjoyed, like, looking at these these paintings. I don't know how, like, accurate they are because I know that artists will take, you know, license with a lot of this stuff, but, um, but they're fun to look at. At the end of the long siege of Mantua. Two years later, fighting under General Moreau's command, Serrurier and his division were cut off by the Russians and forced to surrender. Released on parole, he was back in Paris in time to support Napoleon's coup d'état of 18 Brumaire. Serrurier then retired from active command, but Napoleon, remembering his past service, made him an honorary marshal and governor of Les Invalides, the retirement home and hospital for old soldiers. Oh. So they had that back then, huh? Like, I know hospitals for soldiers are pretty commonplace today. Like, at least we have the VA over here, uh, the Veterans Administration, that have their own hospitals and stuff for 
uh, like veterans. Um, I didn't know that that was a thing though back then. That seems like one of those things that Napoleon may have like established himself. Like, because I know that he, a lot of you guys have told me that he uh, kind of brought about a lot of modernization, of a lot of new things to Europe. And I wonder if like that's one of them. But I don't know. Maybe those sorts of places existed before this. But I don't know. It just seems like a Napoleon thing to do. Especially because he seems to have a lot of respect for veterans in particular. Because he's, you know, recognizing these these guys past military history. So, I don't know, it just seems like a Napoleon thing to do, but I could be way off on that. There, shortly before the fall of Paris in 1814, Serrurier oversaw the burning of more than a thousand captured flags and standards to prevent them falling into Allied hands. Remember that. 23. Marshal Kellerman. I think that I was probably the boldest general who ever lived, but even I wouldn't have dared to take post there. High praise from Napoleon. Kellerman was another honorary marshal, the oldest at 68, and famed throughout France oh. as the savior of the revolution. A career soldier really? from a middle-class background, he'd seen distinguished service as a cavalry officer in the Seven Years' War. You know, I'm gonna have to learn about the Seven Years' War because I know that that was a thing over here in the U.S. Um, I heard, I mean, like I've seen the oversimplified videos on the American Revolution and they do mention in there that uh, there was an incident that happened in the U.S. that sparked the Seven Years' War. But uh, I, I don't know, I may not have understood that correctly, but I don't really know anything about the Seven Years' War, even though we were over here in the U.S. apparently involved in it. That's another one that kind of goes along with the War of 1812 that I don't know much about, or really anything, honestly. At the beginning of the Revolutionary Wars, he was a general, commanding a frontier army at the moment of greatest crisis, when it seemed foreign invasion was about to stamp out the revolution and restore the Ancien Regime. But at Valmy, in September 1792, Kellerman's Army of the Centre stood its ground, and with a ferocious artillery barrage, persuaded the Prussian army to withdraw. Valmy was not a stunning tactical victory, but it was a turning point of history that saved the infant French Republic. When the revolution took a more radical turn, even a war hero like Kellerman became suspected of royalist links and spent a year in prison under the threat of the guillotine. Acquitted and restored to command, he was poised to launch a new offensive in Italy when he was sidelined, first by General Scherer, then in favour of a rising new talent, General Bonaparte. Hmm. Kellerman later specialised in army administration and training, a role he continued to perform under Napoleon, whilst also entering politics and serving as President of the Senate. His son, General Francois Etienne Kellerman, followed in his father's footsteps, serving as one of Napoleon's best cavalry commanders. Hmm. That's cool. 22. Marshal Grouchy. Oh, Grouchy, not Grouchy. Oops, that was a really bad pronunciation on my part. It looks like Grouchy, that's why I said it that way, but obviously it's French, so... Um, his conduct was unforeseeable, as if his army on the march had been struck by an earthquake and swallowed up. Napoleon on Grouchy's failure to march to his aid during the Battle of Waterloo. Okay, he didn't like him. Uh, I do re I do recall that from Waterloo vaguely. <laughs> Again, it was just a lot to go to to remember, but I do I do remember that actually that Napoleon was counting on him and he never he didn't come. So <clears throat> when Napoleon returned from his first exile in 1815, he created one last marshal for the upcoming campaign, Emmanuel de Grouchy. Although now infamous for failing to march to Napoleon's aid during the Battle of Waterloo, up to that moment Grouchy had had a long and distinguished military career. An aristocrat who embraced the French Revolution, Grouchy served with distinction throughout the Revolutionary Wars, fighting counter-revolutionaries in the Vendée and serving in Italy, where he was wounded and captured at the Battle of Novi. 
Under the Empire, Grouchy excelled as commander of a Dragoon division in Marshal Murat's cavalry reserve. He okay. was praised by the... Um, I have to ask you guys, I probably asked this at one point during the Napoleonic Wars, but again, it's been a long time. What is a Dragoon division? Obviously it has to do with the cavalry, but I can't... I can't recall what that means exactly, so please let me know down in the comments again. If you don't mind, I'd appreciate it. ...by the Emperor for his part in the great French charge at Eylau. Played an important role buying time for Napoleon at Friedland. And expertly covered the French right wing at Wagram. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded 3rd Cavalry Corps and was wounded at Borodino. He survived the horrors of the retreat, but was left so exhausted it took him several months to recover. He returned for Napoleon's 1814 campaign in France, and was wounded twice more. Grouchy was made a marshal at the start of the Hundred Days campaign, and commanded Napoleon's right wing at Ligny. After the battle was won, he was ordered to pursue the retreating Prussians to prevent them joining up with Wellington's Anglo-Allied army. Two days later, as the Battle of Waterloo raged ten miles to the west, Grouchy made the fateful decision to follow his written orders, rather than march to join Napoleon, and has been widely blamed for the French Emperor's defeat ever since. Grouchy's vilification is not wholly fair, not least because Napoleon rarely encouraged his marshals to show initiative, and often flew into rages if they deviated from his written orders. Nor should one blunder obscure the distinguished record of one of the Grande Armée's best cavalry generals. Grouchy fled to America after Napoleon's defeat to escape oh. royalist reprisals, but was pardoned and returned to France in 1820. Hmm. 21. Marshal Monsey. He was an honest man. Okay, pretty simple. Monsey ran away from home to join the army at the age of 15. After 20 years of uneventful service, he'd risen no higher than the rank of captain. But then came the French Revolution. Oh, look, all of these guys Most... are wearing their caps sideways. So I guess it was a, well, I don't know. I guess it was a thing that some people just did. I don't know, I'm, I'm not up on all the fashion of the uh, late 1700s, 1800s. Most French officers were aristocrats, who, if they did not actively oppose the revolution, were nevertheless regarded as politically suspect. The result was that three quarters of them either fled the country or were dismissed from the army. Monsey, a middle-class officer with no strong political views, reaped the benefit with meteoric promotion. By 1794, General Monsey was leading the army of the Western Pyrenees to victory over the Spanish, on what was admittedly a relative backwater of the Revolutionary Wars. In 1797 he was dismissed for alleged royalist sympathies, but reinstated in time to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire. By his own admission, Monsey was a sensitive officer, Honest, honourable, but lacking a ruthless streak or iron will to succeed. Napoleon was aware of his limitations as a general, but made him a marshal in 1804, as part of his emphasis on continuity between the Republic and his new empire. Monsey was appointed Inspector General of the Gendarmerie, France's militarised police force, and spent most of the rest of his career commanding reserve troops. He only held one field command again. In light of his victorious record against the Spanish, he was given command of a corps for the 1808 invasion of Spain, operating in the south of the country with mixed success. In 1809 he was replaced by General Junot, and returned to France. Monsey's finest hour came in the dying days of the Empire, leading the National Guard of Paris in a courageous but doomed defence of the French capital. In 1815, the restored King of France, Louis XVIII, ordered Marshal Monsey to preside at the trial of Marshal Ney for treason. Monsey regarded Ney as a hero, 
for having saved so many French lives in Russia, and refused, declaring, If I am not allowed to save my country, nor my own life, then at least I will save my honour. After a short spell in prison, Monsey was allowed to resume his military career, becoming governor of Les Invalides, in which role he presided over the repatriation of Napoleon's remains from St Helena in 1840. At the end of the ceremony, the 86-year-old Marshal Monsey announced, And now, let us go home to die. 20. Okay. Yeah, I guess, you know, not everybody has the sort of drive that Napoleon did. Not everybody's, uh, you know, cut out to be the general type. Also, this is the second time that they have mentioned that King Louis was restored to the throne. They may have gone over this in oversimplified French Revolutionary videos, but um, I mean, I just need to learn more about France's history. And I'm sure you guys have also mentioned this in the comments. And I actually think I remember it now that I'm thinking about it. But so the French Revolution happened, the Bourbon, it was the Bourbon King, Bour Bourbon Kings, Somebody said it's not bourbon as in like the drink, but it's bourbon or something like that. Those kings were all beheaded and, or their royals were all beheaded and the revolution happened. A lot of people kind of were in charge for a while. And then Napoleon came in, established himself as emperor. And then after Napoleon, it looks like everybody went back to the um, monarchy, basically. So is that kind of what happened? Just want to make sure I understand kind of the order of things and what happened in France. Because you know what, that is, that's crazy that the royals were done away with and all of that horrible, like the terrors and all of that stuff happened with the French Revolution, only to go back to the monarchy again. So it's just, I just need to learn more about that. Marshal Poniatowski. A man of noble character, brimming over with honor and bravery. Prince Józef Poniatowski was the King of Poland's nephew, but his military career began as a cavalry officer in the Austrian army. He okay, sorry. You probably heard the dog barking and had to go deal with that. She is back in here now. And serving as aide de Prince Józef Poniatowski was the King of Poland's nephew, but his military career began as a cavalry officer in the Austrian army even serving as aide-de-camp to Emperor Józef II himself. In 1789, he transferred to the Polish army with the rank of Major General, but could not save Poland from partition by its rapacious neighbours, Russia, Prussia and Austria. By 1795, Poland had vanished from the map, swallowed up by its rivals. After Napoleon's defeat of Prussia in 1806, Poniatowski decided loyal service to the French Emperor was the best way to win Poland's restoration, although he never fully trusted Napoleon's aims. Sombre, serious and brave, Poniatowski proved an able commander of Duchy of Warsaw forces in Napoleon's service. When war broke out with Austria in 1809, while Napoleon advanced on Vienna, Poniatowski waged a brilliant supporting campaign against a larger Austrian army in Galicia. For the invasion of Russia, he commanded the Polish V Corps. He and his troops distinguished themselves first at Smolensk and again at Borodino, leading the attack on the right wing. Poniatowski and his corps performed heroically throughout the campaign, motivated in part by their old animosity towards Russia. But by the end of the retreat, Fifth Corps had been virtually destroyed. Poniatowski remained loyal to Napoleon, even though the disaster in Russia paved the way for the Russian reoccupation of Poland. He rejoined Napoleon in Germany in 1813 and was given command of the Polish Eighth Corps. On the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, he was made a marshal by Napoleon, in recognition of his service and to inspire his Polish troops. Poniatowski was the only non-Frenchman to receive this honour. Oh, wow. He and his troops fought with their usual tenacity and skill at Leipzig, holding key villages on the southern front against the Austrian and Prussian onslaught. 
At the end of the battle, Poniatowski commanded part of the rearguard. But their only escape route, a bridge over the Elster River, was blown up too soon. Badly wounded, Poniatowski tried to escape by riding his horse across the river. But he was swept from his saddle and drowned. Mm. He had been a marshal for just four days. Oh my In the gosh. I have to say, the Leipzig, that, that video and that battle, I think might be my favorite out of this entire series. That one was just like super dramatic on another level. Um, you know, the whole like Napoleon trying to defend France was also, um, you know, fun to watch as well. But the Leipzig one, this one was just, I don't know, extra memorable to me. He had been a marshal for just four days. In the short term, Poniatowski's loyalty to France achieved nothing, as following Napoleon's defeat, Russia occupied Poland for the next century. But Poniatowski's legend lived on, a model of Polish patriotism that inspired future generations. Wait a second, what? Okay, so this is his memorial, but he's dressed as a Roman soldier. I mean, I guess that they are like distinguishing him as, you know, being as good as like a, I don't know, historical Roman. I, I don't know how to like say it. I'm not saying this correctly, but you know what I mean? Like putting him on the level of like distinguished Roman generals or whatever. That looks like what's happening here, but you guys, you guys probably know about this memorial and this statue. So let me know exactly what the significance of this is. Nineteen. Marshal Jourdain. I certainly used... I certainly used that man very, very ill. Jourdain is a true patriot, and that is the answer to many things that have been said about him. Certainly use that man very ill. I don't uh, understand that. As a young French private, Jourdan saw combat in Georgia during the American Revolutionary War. But he then caught a fever that led to his discharge and plagued him for the rest of his life. When the French Revolution began, he was elected captain of his local National Guard unit, fought at the battles of Gemap and Honschauter and was rapidly promoted to general. In 1794, he made his name defeating coalition forces at the Battle of Fleurus. This was a crucial victory of the Revolutionary War, which handed France control of Belgium for 20 years. It was also notable for the French army's use of balloon reconnaissance, the first effective use of an aircraft in military history. No way! I didn't know that was a thing. Huh. Let me look at this picture here. The first effective use of an aircraft. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's really, really cool. Also really, really dangerous, I would imagine. You know, somebody could just shoot that thing down, right? Huh. That's, that's pretty funny. Um, I'm watching them, like, hold on to them with the ropes and stuff down there. I mean, like, for the time, it was probably pretty ingenious, you know? And obviously, it would give you a huge advantage having that, um, you know, viewpoint of the battlefield. So, I mean, it's really, really cool. Uh, but it also looks, I mean, just, you know, going by modern standards, it looks funny uh, having, <laughs> they're doing spying from a balloon, hot air balloon, I guess. I guess I didn't realize hot air balloons went that far back. I mean, I know that they're kind of an older technology, but I'm not sure exactly when they kind of came about. So obviously, before this time. Aircraft in military history. Huh. Jourdan became a prominent politician under the Directory, lending his name to a law that formalised France's policy of mass conscription. As a committed Republican, Jourdan refused to support Napoleon's coup of 18 Brumaire, but his fame as the victor of Fleurus was enough to ensure he became a marshal in 1804. Jourdan was on good terms with Napoleon's elder brother, Joseph. When Joseph became King of Spain in 1808, Jourdan went with him as his military advisor. 
but the situation in Spain would prove beyond Jourdan's military skills to solve. He faced stubborn resistance from the Spanish and Portuguese, supported by the British, and an equally stubborn refusal to cooperate from other French marshals in Spain, theoretically under Jourdan's command, but who repeatedly ignored his orders and openly questioned his competence. Marshal Soult in Andalusia was a prime offender, while Marshal Victor's insubordination at the Battle of Talavera contributed directly to the French defeat. Struck by another bout of ill health, Jourdan went home to recover. Two years later he returned to Spain, but at the Battle of Vitoria in 1813, he and King Joseph were outmaneuvered and decisively beaten by Wellington. Mm. Leading to the collapse. This is the uh, the video that Epic History TV is supposed to be coming out with, right? So if that's the case, especially if it involves Wellington, I'd be definitely interested in going back and watching it. Hi there. The collapse of the Bonapartist Kingdom of Spain. Jordan never held a major command again, but his 20 years of service and evident patriotism were widely recognized and respected. He was made a peer by Napoleon, a count by Louis XVIII, and died in 1833 while serving as governor of Les Invalides. Perignon, Brun, Serrurier, Kellerman, Grouchy, Monsey, Bonyatovsky, Jourdan. Eight down, 18 to go. Join us for part two when we'll continue the countdown. Coming soon. All right, well, you heard him. Join us for part two coming soon, and it will be coming soon, probably in the next few days or so on this channel. There's going to be a lot to unpack here, a lot of marshals, so we're doing 26 of them. Yeah, he's mentioning some things in this series that I'm kind of recalling from some of the videos, and I'm also like picking up on some new stuff here and there as well, so that's good. So anyway, I know I have a lot of new questions for you guys to answer. Please do that down in the comments. You guys know that I do read the comments. It really helps me learn a lot. And then we'll pick some of your comments to read out in our next video. I really like this. It's kind of giving me a slightly different perspective of Napoleon and kind of the Napoleonic Wars in general, just kind of seeing them from a slightly different perspective and also learning a little bit more about just kind of like French history and some of just French culture and the way life was back then because we're getting into a little bit of their private lives and stuff in this. So anyway, if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like, share, and subscribe. And also if you are so inclined, you can follow me on social media. On Facebook, I have a group as well. So you'll want to look that up because we have a lot of fun discussion that happens in there. Some of you have been asking about my Discord and I actually have a made my Discord. It's up and running. I just have to um, figure out how to add the bots to it to kind of automate a lot of the new member stuff. So I'm going to be trying to work on that later today and get the Discord up and running this week because I know a lot of you are really getting uh, eager to join that. So, and I am also probably, oh no, 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 no. Oh boy, uh, Scarlet was just chewing on my teddy bear. This is a teddy bear that I've had since I was a year old, and it was like my my best little bud growing up, and Scarlet was just chewing on it, so um, now I know that I cannot have this anywhere close to where Scarlet can get to it. Everybody can say hi to Scarlet. She's gotta make her appearance. All right, no. No, this is off limits. Get down. Thank you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes, I'm one of those adults that actually still likes their teddy bear. <laughs> anyway, Roger here and I thank you guys for watching. We hope you will join us next time for part two of Napoleon's Marshals. Say goodbye, Scarlet. She's ready to go play. <laughs> okay, we'll see you guys next time.